Uh, I would like to go over to Derek now because we talked about the tri-border area, we talked about Venezuela, we talked about uh, things that came up in your testimony this week before Congress. And, and, I, and I'd like to ask you about Project Cassandra. I'd like to ask you about how the DEA had been working very hard against Hezbollah for some time in Latin America. But uh, like I wrote in my Washington Times column, uh, my view was that the Obama administration, from evidence that I have, really made things a bit slower against Hezbollah to get the Iran nuclear deal through. And I wanted to ask you your thoughts on that about Project Cassandra, which has been around for about 10 years. Now it's being reinvigorated under the Attorney General and the new task force against Hezbollah. But I wonder if you can expound upon that for our audience. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much, and appreciate the opportunity to come here. And we have the expert right there. He's on his phone, Matt Levitt. Wake up, Matt. Texting about you right now. Anyway, I say that only because Matt wrote a really, really awesome piece this week, and I would highly recommend that you read it because he was very fair in his assessment. So one thing I want to make clear is that I'm not going to be used in the Beltway as the, the Beltway ping pong game, you know, the political ping pong game. We have a serious global national security threat to this country, and I was lucky to be in the heart of the Special Operations Division for 10 years. So. I'm not going to get into what Obama did and what he didn't do. We have to move forward. It was very awesome to see the bold leadership of Jeff Sessions to make that decision. But I got news for you. I've seen plenty of task forces being set up in this country with no action. Okay? And it's easy to distract people's attention by setting up a task force and then, like, you know, taking the attention off the task force and then going on to the Beltway problems of death. I don't have a lot of patience for that. So John Cronin is a really good guy. He worked in the Southern District of New York. And I want to highlight something really important to everyone in the room, because this is one of my main topics of discussion. In 2010, putting all the politics aside, please, Preet Bharara, who is the US attorney in Southern District of New York, he broke down the walls between international terrorism and drug trafficking. So why is that important? Because he recognized you know, eight years ago that these international terrorists need funding right, and state sponsorship has gone down, and other funding streams have gone away, so crime is a great way to make money, to, to corrupt, you know, to pay the general in West Africa a suitcase of cash, right, because you can't use Visa or MasterCard. And so, pre Ferrara decided, I want my best prosecutors to go after the biggest threats in this country, and that was really awesome, and he's the only one, as far as I know, that has done that. I wish Jeff Sessions would start doing that kind of stuff, because that's what's needed, all right? Now, speaking of Project Cassandra, now, this is something that absolutely amazed me as a senior executive in the DEA. My father was in the government for 30 years, and I was lucky to be in his job. But when I started seeing this unbelievable thing emerge, it all started for me in 2007 when Admiral James Stavridis showed me a picture of a fireball. And he said, from his view at Special at Southern Command in Florida, he started seeing the emergence of all of these Middle Eastern groups from Lebanon, and exactly what uh, Vanessa's talking about, this just, this monster, and I like that, I'm going to steal it. The monster was growing many years ago, and, and, and Admiral Stavridis, the Supreme uh, Allied Commander from NATO later on, he saw this growing, and so did General Kelly. I mean, he's been very public about his views on this area of Latin America with this, uh, this, this convergence of crime and peril. But anyway, then, of course, I'm reading the news and I see our Director of Homeland Security, Michael Chertoff, saying Hezbollah makes Al-Qaeda look like the minor leagues. So wake up, people. This is a serious threat. So as the head of the Special Operations Division, I don't know much about Hezbollah. I'm not an expert on this global terrorist group. I'm, a, I'm, a, you know, I'm an investigator. I'm, a, I'm an agent from the DEA. We focus on drugs. And we start seeing this thing grow. And then we start seeing the tons of cocaine leaving South America, and then there's $200 million a month with Ahmed Juma, and this was very alarming to me. Okay, so I'll give you an example. A DEA agent, undercover, picked up $20 million in cash in Central America. They were allegedly sitting on $100 million they needed moved. This organization working with the Mexican cartels. So we started seeing this thing grow, and grow, and grow. And I was very concerned. I'm the head of this multi-agency center. We have a counter-narco-terrorism operations center. We want to work it together. Now, this is where it really gets stupid. 
President Obama in 2011 had his transnational organized crime strategy. Go on the website, look at it. You'll probably see something very similar to President Trump. The idea of going after transnational uh, organized crime and doing it in what I call, or what they call, a unity of effort. You ever heard this expression in the Beltway, tools of national power? Give me a break. Now, here's the part that's interesting. And it's funny, because I sit next to the CIA guy. There's some amazing, amazing Americans every day that go to work, whether it's Langley, or NSA, or FBI headquarters, or DEA. These people work their butts off. What good is it if it's not synergized? Like, what good is it? You're standing up centers with capabilities, and then another center stands up a redundant capability, and you're wasting your money. We're all wasting our money. So what we saw is a lot of good work, but we couldn't come together. All right? Now, let, let's make sure that's clear. And Matt was pretty clear about that in his piece. So we have everyone doing good work against Hezbollah, but the idea of the transnational organized crime strategy is put it together. Because in my little world, I'm a DEA guy. Yeah, drugs, money laundering, terror, yeah. But in his world, or his colleagues' world, there's other threats that we don't even see. So we don't have all the answers in law enforcement. But neither do they in the, in the intel community. But we're all good people trying to save America and protect America. The question is, is there's going to be leadership to pull it together? And how are we going to do that? Because it's very complicated. Because everyone has their own mission. Everyone has their own agenda. Everyone has their own budget. So it's, it, but it's not something that can't be done. Because we saw it in Cassandra at a much lower degree. I mean, we seized $150 million. We shut down you know, a bunch of things that were going on. Uh, but we only scratched the surface. We, we, we didn't even touch the surface. Because we didn't put together what I like to say is a unity of effort. And it's a damn shame. And I asked Mr. Comey on his last day on the job, on my last day of the job, what are we going to do about all those businesses that are still out there moving these cars from America back to West Africa? What are we going to do? What are we doing? So anyway, I get very passionate about this topic, and primarily because I see what a national security threat it is, and I see the lack of sense of urgency going on in this town. I mean, people have the attention span of gnats around here. <laughs> like, wake up, because we have kids, we have grandkids, we have nephews and nieces, and we have friends and family, and that's what we're talking about. So when are we going to get together and work on this problem together? And stop with this damn turf battles. And Matt, you're right, at least from my standpoint, okay? Yeah, there's turf battles every day. And you're going to hear more of me about that, because as we come up to the anniversary of the Boston bombing, and when I saw the catastrophic failure of information sharing in that event, the public needs to be aware of that. So let's, let's knock it off and let's get our stuff together. But I could go on and on and on. And I see uh, the MC there, Catherine. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so I'll shut down and you know, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Derek, for those great comments. We really appreciate it. Well, um, but I would like to uh, go back over to Derek and to see if he could follow up on some of the, the comments he made about um, some of the threats we face with Hezbollah, uh, with the coordination between uh, inter our interagency partners. And I'd like you to also talk about, if you can, your, uh, your cooperation with international partners in your past experience in the DEA or for a career in the DEA. And how's that been going? And do you see that the trend uh, in improving? Um, how, how is the status of it today? Okay, so let me just start out by saying, like, if you run a business in the world, you're trying to make money, right? And you're trying to reduce your risk. Well, the Colombian entrepreneurs, South American entrepreneurs, they want to make money and reduce risk. Mm -hmm. So if you could sell a kilogram of cocaine in Australia for up to, you know, let's just say 100 to 300,000 US dollars, because I know when I was there it was 300,000, now it's maybe 100, 200. Why wouldn't you want to sell drugs in Australia? Why would you want to sell drugs in America? Because first of all, if you're Colombian, it has to go through Mexico, and that's a disaster right now with all the violence and everything going on. Once it gets into America, now you're taking a chance of being extradited to America, because America has really good extradition laws. So these guys made a business decision to start moving dope around the world so they can make more money and reduce risk. Unfortunately, what we saw is this convergence with these groups Specifically in Venezuela, they had a command and control at the airport with General Carvajal and Walid Makhled. And these guys were controlling 
all the multi-ton shipments that were leaving Venezuela coming from the FARC, right? This monster, I keep stealing her line. I like that line. Uh, anyway, and so now you have the drugs moving into West Africa, and most people say, oh, what's the big deal? Let the drugs go to West Africa. No, because the money's being collected and going back to Hezbollah. One thing I didn't say is that we looked at aerial photos before the war in 2006 with Israel, and all these car parks were vacant. West Africa, there was just nothing along the uh, shoreline. Go look at those, those uh, pictures today. You see thousands and thousands and thousands of cars, used cars. It's all because the scheme is just massive, okay? Because they're smart. They're business people. And they designed this global trade-based money laundering scheme to sell used cars, not just in America, but all over the world now. And so the problem is, is that one of the things I cannot comprehend, and there's a lot of smart people in this room. I know there's doctors up on the stage. There's former guys that were working WMD. And I know there's doctors there. One of my friends in the back there, she snuck in. She's another expert, Celine. Selena in the back, and I was sitting next to her in the panel. I love sitting next to the smart people because when tough questions come in, I don't have to worry about it. Okay, <laughs> so here's the deal. Think about this. Everyone in America has recognized that terrorists are turning to crime and criminal networks for their funding, right? I don't think anyone's really disputing that anymore. But then why is it that the people that work terrorism and the people that work criminal cases don't communicate? Can anyone in this room explain that to me? other than this institutional barrier, right? Now, people are not going to work every day going, I'm not gonna to talk to those DEA guys or Homeland Security. That's not how it goes. But, that's what's happening, all right? Like, when the Russians got information on Camelin, why wouldn't the FBI want to check my center? I have 30 agencies, all this criminal intelligence. Maybe Tamil was involved with drugs, which he was, by the way which we never knew about until after the bomb, okay? So you can't have a system set up where there's that wall. I love his story. This is beautiful stuff. NCTC sounds good on paper, right? I'm the director of NCTC. I know everything going on. You're not even talking to the criminal investigators. How the hell do you know what's going on? And so even in the building, I mean, he was 100% being honest because I have friends in all these agencies, and that's how it went. He had the wall up in the in the building, and that's in that building where you think everything is running smoothly. So it gets very complicated. I'm not going to sit here and suggest that I have like all the answers. In regards to international, let me just say this, and I said it the other day. The best partner we had in this whole project, Cassandra, was the Colombians. Now why? When we picked up a million dollars in New York in 2004, and we had to send the money back to Colombia, it was on behalf of the AUC in Colombia. And the Colombian National Police identified all these brokers, they identified all these people down in the ground in Colombia. And then our office in Miami, working with Colombia, next thing I started doing is legal, judicialized intercepts in Colombia. That's how we identified this whole scheme. So when you talk about partnerships, mm -hmm. the partnerships are critical. And that's one thing like DEA, I don't wave the DEA flag, but I want to tell everyone something. DEA has been working with the international partners for, you know, for the whole life of DEA. Not because DEA is better than any other agency, but DEA had a very specific mission with drugs, and most counterparts always you have something in common with drugs, you know, let's get rid of drugs. So we built up these relationships for 40 years overseas, so when something happens overseas, DEA can move very quickly to work with the counterparts and go after these bad guys. The problem is, is that there's a lot of bureaucracy as well. Like when you're working overseas, certain things have to be done. So we have to sit down and we have to just carve out, like if I had my you know, dream scenario, it would be like a task force environment where every person in that task force has the same um, you know, <coughs> interest, that's to keep America safe, and everyone puts their expertise on the table. So in the Cassandra case, one of the things I want to highlight is that, yeah, DEA for years saw this massive cocaine money laundering operation, but really we were very limited in what we could do. It was Treasury and CBP that came to the table, Customs and Border Protection, and started adding value. And the next thing I heard about was this Patriot Act 311 action and these OFAC designations. 
and this 981K action that Treasury bought to the pay. So without that task force <coughs> mix, DEA, we would have had just a bunch of drugs moving around the country and some money. It was amazing to see how it did come together. There was synergy, but it wasn't a complete synergy because there were other agencies. And again, I don't, I don't want to pick on any agents because it's really not the agent's fault. He said it again, this guy's smart. The work of bees, they're gonna work the cases. They're trying to go to work and do the right thing to protect America. But the bosses are saying, don't talk to those guys, they're working drugs. Don't talk to those guys, they're working guns. So the money going back to the terrorists, what are you talking about? So anyway, this is a big problem that has to be addressed, and you are right. There's an old saying, don't throw stones if you live in glass house, right? How are you going to tell Latin America how to go after Hezbollah when we can't even figure it out yet? We haven't figured out. There's just a lack of direction. So that threat mitigation working group that President Obama designated to run this national threat campaign, it failed because if we didn't get the agencies together, as far as I'm concerned, that's a failure. So we'll see what happens now. John Cronin, I have a lot of uh, hope for John Cronin, but again, you know, he needs help. He needs people. Mr. Sessions, Jeff Sessions, has to get involved. So far, he has shown me that he's going to get involved with these crime and terror cases. So if he gets involved and he starts giving the resources, giving the support, we will start coming together. But it's not going to be effective unless the intelligence community aligns, you know, their priorities with the law enforcement priorities. Because their priorities at times could be way more important. But you have to know what they are. That, that's the issue, right? You know, there's a lot of friction, but, like, if, you don't, if I don't have the insight as to what this man's doing against Hezbollah and the operatives around the world that may be trying to blow up a nuclear weapon, let's say, and I'm looking at this little drug case, of course that would be a priority, right? And so we worry about that all the time. And I'll tell you one last thing, only because it's very relevant to this. So the worst thing in my world as the head of SOD is if I screwed up a terrorism case. So we're working a drug case, and we had one where there was a wiretap where we followed a car into a state. We went into the, uh, they went into a, a location, they came out with a big bag of cocaine. We stopped the car, we arrested these subjects, and then we went back to the warehouse to do a search warrant. Right in the middle of this damn surveillance, two Jordanian males come out of the warehouse, get into a Jaguar and drive away. Well, we thought, hey, this is very suspicious. So the police did a stop on the car. They really didn't speak any English. It turns out it was part of another agency's major terrorist finance case. I was mad because we inadvertently blew that case. Now these guys know the police are watching. Well, this is what happens when you don't coordinate and cooperate and communicate. So if we don't get the leaders to start stepping up and start holding people accountable, then this is going to continue. Yeah, excellent point. I'm really glad you brought that up, Eric. There was a, one thing I was going to tell you. Um, after 9-11, so I was at the old SOD at night during 9-11. Of course, it was devastating to everyone. And then watching the dysfunctional government trying to operate was also concerning. And what happened was the FBI, the DEA, and the Attorney General recognized that they needed to have better coordination between the criminal unit at SOD and and the terror units in, in the government. So they formed what they called a special coordination unit in 2002. And it was led by the FBI's counterterrorism at the time. So the concept was great, right? You're gonna have a unit now within this organization that's working crime, right? So you can better facilitate. And then over time, we wound up putting people at the National JTTF right here at Liberty Crossing. And you know we wound up putting somebody in the intelligence community uh, location. The thing is, the wheels came off the bus. You know how it goes, right? The problem of the day, something else comes up, priorities are over here, and the thing kind of fell apart. Now, the SINTOC, which we now call it in uh, SOD, is still very functional and very operational and very successful. But some of the other partners are not really there anymore. So what I've been saying publicly in congressional testimony, in media events, is if somebody says, hey, we want to use that SINTOC, to kind of form a better uh, integrated effort with the intel community, it can happen tomorrow. This is not very complicated. You just need somebody to do it. I mean, the one thing that always worries me, 
like when I was asked what keeps me up at night is that this is in our backyard, right? This is Western Hemisphere, it's right here. It's easy to get to America. And so that's the whole the thing that bothers me. I mean, Venezuela has been a hub for at least global drug trafficking for many years, but when the FARC started exploding and started building up customers around the world, and then when the Mexican cartel started building up customers around the world, we started seeing the alliance between the Mexican cartels and the Venezuelans, and then the, the planes and boats going to West Africa. And that's where it kind of grew like to the point where I was very, very concerned because now you have all these groups in Africa, like AQIM and AQAP and these other terror groups that are now starting to take advantage of, you know, moving drugs, kidnappings, taxing, the stuff that we saw in Colombia with the AUC and the FARC, where nobody would call them drug organizations. Nobody would call them terror organizations. So we debate back and forth in the Beltway, you know, why these guys just grow in power and strength, and we're sitting here like hogs. One of the things I always like to say is Al Capone was this mass murderer, and we took him down with a tax violation, right? It's the same thing. You could be Al-Qaeda, but if you're moving a kilo of cocaine, take them down. Get them off the battlefield. Neutralize them. That's the point. And that's why I'm very passionate, even with this Boston bombing thing. When these JPTFs get intelligence on a potential terrorist, that doesn't mean you're going to have any intel that they're a potential terrorist. But you might have intel that they're involved with drugs or guns or gangs. So let the JTTF partner agencies investigate that for the criminal activity they're involved in. Who cares if you get them for a crime or a terror act? Take them off the field. <coughs> Neutralize them. I agree. <laughs> Great points, everyone. Let's, uh, yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so this question is for uh, Mr. Pattis and Mr. Maltz. I'm Sam White with the House Financial Services Committee. Um, we talked a lot about uh, cooperation between uh, agencies in combating uh, Hezbollah. We've also mentioned NCTC, SOD, JTTF. Um, what should that cooperation look like? Since we've already got a number of organizations that kind of do that already uh, in certain contexts, but perhaps not in others, uh, what should it look like in this context? So let me just take a shot at that as well. I mean, leadership is the key to everything. If the person in charge says, this is what we're going to do, and in a week, I'm going to check up and find out the status, and they stay on top of it, this is not that hard. You can get it done easily. We have enough centers, and that's why I was very vocal the other day, is the last thing we need is create a tox center. We want to waste money and create a tox center. We have centers, we have the agencies, we have the technology. Yeah, we may need a couple of things here and there for technology, because it's advancing so quickly. But it's just a matter of having the people together, sharing, unity of effort, common goals, what are we trying to do, and then have somebody in charge to prioritize. Because what law enforcement may think is the most important case in the world may not really be that important when you're looking at a bigger issue with, let's say, North Korea or China. But you have to put it on the table so you can evaluate your actual ideas of best ways forward. You can't just be blind to what law enforcement or the intel community is doing. You have to have a comprehensive understanding. Somebody's got to be in charge. And that's kind of one of the problems here. There's nobody really in charge of these things. So my thing is, is that if the president says that the DOJ threat mitigation worker group is in charge of this, then hold them accountable. Hold them accountable. Because then they have the job of pulling everything together. They didn't do it when I was there. Hopefully they'll do it under this new task force arrangement. But it's really not very complicated. It's just like, like uh, Ed said, you have to get the people to just direct it and stay on top of it. And somebody's got to be in charge. And you have to have an operational implementation plan. Because you can have all the strategies in the world. doesn't mean anything if you're not going to implement the strategies. That's why like that White House strategy in 2011, you dust it off, give it to President Trump. Here you go. Here's your strategy. Same thing, pretty much. Thank you, guys.